What I wanted to do to start today's session in, in today's series of speakers is to talk about an executive summary of digital transformation best practices. And this is actually a presentation and a discussion I often give to a client executive teams um, as a sort of expectation setting and a, and a sort of uh, backdrop setting exercise, really just to get everyone on the same page with what digital transformation is and how does this apply to our business or our organization and ultimately, how can we define a strategy and roadmap for us that makes the most sense, given our unique circumstances, whether it's our industry, our strategic goals and objectives, our you know macroeconomic trends we're trying to address, whatever it is, we want to make sure we have a, a clearly aligned and clearly articulated strategy. And that's really the intent of what, what uh, today's conversation is meant to cover. So with that all being said, let me um, go ahead and share my screen here. All right. So as I mentioned, this is an executive summary of digital transformation best practices. Um, if we go to the next slide here, you can see um, one of the things I always like to start with is, and, and this was actually a question that came up in my presentation yesterday, uh, or one of the, I, it might've been in the Q and A at the end of the day, uh, the question came up of what is, what is digital transformation? What does the term mean? And, and how do you describe it? Um, what kind of technology does it entail? And if I were to simplify, um, and maybe just summarize what digital transformation is. It's essentially any use of technology to improve your business. If I did in the simplest terms, that's the way I would describe it. It's, it's any any sort of technology that allows you to improve your business. And and along with the technology, obviously, there's the process prov improvements, the organizational uh, implications, and whatnot. But in general, it can be any sort of technology. And a lot of times people will ask, you know, well, does that mean ERP, you know, enterprise resource planning software, or how does HCM or CRM fit into that? Or how does artificial intelligence fit into that? And I think with digital transformation, it's important to, at, at times, just sort of set aside the buzzwords, um, set aside all the um, industry trends and things of that nature. It's good to know, you know, as an input or good to have as an input. But at the end of the day, it's really about what technologies are best going to enable whatever goals you're trying to accomplish. And for some organizations, it could be, you know, a single standard ERP system that's going to drive a common operating model throughout the world, global operations. Or for other organizations, it might be more of a best of breed approach where we're going to deploy different CRM and HR technologies and different financial systems to address our specific needs. Uh, for or other organizations, it might be more of a piecemeal, you know, very targeted uh, technology technological approach. So it really does depend on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So whenever you hear the terms like industry 4.0 and internet of things and AI and machine learning, it can be overwhelming. And it's important not to get too lost in those details or those uh, buzzwords and trends. Again, you want to understand them. You want to understand where technology is headed, but you also want to understand more importantly, what it is you need, because there's a lot of stuff out there in the marketplace honestly, most of it you probably don't need. There's probably just a handful of different types of technologies that will best enable whatever it is you're, you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, again, it's, it's really looking at your entire organization and the scope of your organization, what you're trying to accomplish, and then finding the technology that best fits that. Another question we often get sort of related to, to this previous slide is what is, what is digital tr transformation in, in terms of how it compares to ERP implementations? And that's one of the biggest questions we get. And, you know, without getting too caught up in slicing hairs or, or specific nomenclature, I think the bigger thing here is to make sure that we, we have a, a good understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish. So if, if we're looking to simply implement ERP, which is not simple, but if it's more of a focused specific technology that we're trying to roll out through the organization, it you can see how that more myopic or more focused approach differs a bit from um, some of the some of the um, other aspects or some of the different dimensions of, of transformation. So when we look at an overview of these different two different paths here, you have ERP implementations that are more focused on back office technologies. Usually it's one system that's sort of integrating your operations with digital transformation. On the other hand, that's looking more broadly at technology, just technology in general. It's not honing in only on ERP or only on one sort of technology is looking at the entire landscape of the business and the landscape of potential technology options and ultimately figuring out where that technology best fits within your organization. Um, 
if we look at, um, if we could go back to that previous slide, please. Sorry. That's right. The, there's a, if we look at business process management too and organizational change management, those two, uh, the third and fourth boxes there, you see that with ERP implementations, you're, it's more automation and enhancing your existing processes and training people how to use the technology and how to use that new system. If we take more of a digital transformation mindset, which is a bit more holistic and more open-minded, that's where we're looking at potentially more leaps, quantum leaps in technology. So rather than just upgrading our ERP system and creating more incremental improvements or creating some initial automation that didn't exist before, with digital transformation, we're looking at how could we leverage some more emerging technologies or very specific technologies that can help build capabilities that are going to give us a competitive advantage or sell more product, increase our revenue, um, you know, have have mass improvements to our productivity and our effectiveness. You know, it's, it's so it's more of a um, a broader jump, I guess I would say it's, it's a more of a, a broader change to the organization, whereas ERP implementations, which still are very big changes to most organizations, um, it, it is still is a bit more incremental if you're just looking at one specific technology or, or an upgrade of one specific technology. And then when we look at business value, the overall transformation time and cost and the risk, you can see again that ERP implementations are typically more incremental improvements to business value. It's going to take you a certain amount of time to implement ERP systems. But when you're looking at a broader digital transformation, usually it's going to take you longer. It's probably going to cost you more. It's probably going to be a bit more painful and higher risk at times. But organizations that do that are doing that in the name of having higher business value and a higher overall overall ROI. Now, this is not to say that digital transformation is better than having a more focused approach on ERP or CRM or HCM or whatever the technology might be. It's just to say that you, you do need to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish with your with your transformation. And if you're more focused on a digital transformation, then you just know that you'll need to invest more time. It'll probably take longer. There's probably a bit more risk. It's probably a bit more disruptive in the short term because you're you're asking the organization to change more a bit more dramatically. And so think of it as a continuum, you know, maybe, you know, you want to look at where on that continuum or where on that spectrum you fall between more incremental ERP types of implementations versus a broader, more quantum leap digital transformation. And so when we look at um, some of the top challenges of digital transformations and what what organizations struggle with, this is actually a, um, a graphic from our annual digital transformation report, which actually there's a if you're assuming you're watching it here on Crowdcast, you can uh, there's a button right below my slides here that says download the 2021 transformation report. Um, you can actually get that entire report and all the research and best practices that come from it just by clicking the green button. Uh, it's a free download, so I encourage you to check it out. It's uh, we put a lot of uh, thought into that that paper. Um, but in that research white paper, you'll see that there were uh, five top challenges that organizations specified as their biggest challenges and risks as they went through their transformation. So it's sort of a, a backward looking, you know, once the organizations were done with their implementations, as they looked back, what were those biggest challenges that they faced? And you can see that the the number one challenge that people faced was, was organizational change and the people part of the transformation. So this gets back to Teresa's uh, presentation yesterday. If you didn't get a chance to see that, I highly encourage you to go check that out, uh, the recording of that session yesterday, because it does focus more exclusively um, on the people side of things. And I believe we're, we're going to touch on that again later today. And it's hard for us to resent anything as a, as a company and as a team without touching on change management. So you'll get a lot of that throughout Stratosphere in addition to what you've already uh, received along those lines. But the key takeaway here is that change management is the number one concern and challenge that organizations have after they've gone through their transformation. And I, I made the comment before that it's, it's uh, I have yet to meet a, client that has told us, you know, we wish we wish we would have spent more time or spent less time on organizational change management. We just spent way too much on time on change management. We wish we would have spent more time on the technology. Um, I have yet to meet a client. I've never met a client or an organization or even a consultant or team member that's ever said that there's there is such a thing as investing too much in change management. Most organizations say we wish we would have spent a lot more on that. And this is true, by the way, even for organizations that hire us to do the change management, usually even then they still feel like there's more they could have done. And uh, they, you know, they, they sort of uh, feel like there's a lot that uh, they could still do to improve that piece. So change management, people side of the equation is number one. 
the number two challenge that organizations face in their transformations is misalignment with strategic objectives. And that's where you have this dynamic where the corporate or executive team and leadership is taking the direction a certain way, or they have a vision of a certain way they want to take the company, but the ERP project or digital transformation ends up going in a totally different direction. Unintentionally, of course, it's not that people are intentionally trying to be misaligned, but it's because either the project has been delegated to a project team with very little direction, or the executives haven't done enough to clearly articulate what the goals and objectives are of the organization to then translate it into what that means to the digital transformation. Um, or it could be that at some point along the way during the transformation, the path of least resistance sort of overcomes the project and you end up going back to or reverting back to the way you're, you're most comfortable and the way things have always been, which is another way to create misalignment because that's typically not why organizations want to go through the transformation. They typically don't want to remain the same. They typically want to improve, but the path of least resistance is to stay the same. So those, all those things are, are sort of dynamics that uh, create or contribute to that uh, challenge. Um, number three is not managing the system integrators well. And that, that's a really big one. And that's a, a, a very common overlooked challenge that organizations face is that they don't manage their system integrator well. They hire the system integrator or their implementer or their VAR, or their software vendor with the expectation that that third party is an expert in that technology and they therefore will be able to handle a project of this scope and magnitude. There's a couple of problems with that mindset, even though it's understandable why people think that. One problem is that the technology is just one, one work stream within an overall program or a digital transformation program. And so it's unrealistic to expect that your software vendor or your system integrator, your implementer is going to handle all those different pieces of a transformation. They're going to handle one work stream, um, but that's, that's it. I mean, there's other things that need to happen. There's the architecture, the data migration, the integration, the change management, process improvement, the overall project governance and controls. It should really be you managing that, not your system integrator. Um, the second challenge that you see, especially if you're a larger organization and especially if you're working with a larger system integrator. But the second challenge is that you oftentimes get outnumbered and outgunned, for lack of a better word, by your system integrator. They, they have more people staffed on the project. They bring the army of consultants. Many of them, by the way, are straight off the school bus, straight out of college. So there's a lot of issues that come along with that. And there's a lack of transparency often that comes along with that. So this is all a reminder that you do have to view this as your project and you're the one that should set the tumble for the project. You can certainly take inputs from your system integrator. They'll have their proposed project plans or methodologies, their tool sets, but it's your job to validate that that all makes sense for your organization and push back where it doesn't. And it's also your job to wrap around the system integrator, all the other stuff that needs to happen and make sure you're managing that stuff because otherwise it's not going to get done or it's just going to get done very poorly. Um, so those are a few tidbits or, or tips on how to how to manage that challenge. Uh, the number four thing is the clarity of business processes is lacking. And that's a big challenge for organizations. They don't have a vision of what they want to be when they grow up. So what ends up happening is this dynamic of the technical implementer is on site or you know doing workshops with you. They're ready to start deploying technology. And there's a million different ways you can roll out technologies and the workflows within it. And if you don't have a clear understanding of what you want your processes to be, you're going to spend a lot of time spinning your wheels while the army of consultants is billing by the hour for you to figure out what it is you want to be. So you really do have to spend the time if you want to be effective and you want to manage your system integrator better and have a clear vision for the project in general, you want to spend as much time as you can up front defining your business processes, especially in those competitive advantage types of areas and especially in those parts of your business that are very unique to you because it's a competitive differentiator or it's something unique to your industry, unique to the way you deliver to your customers, whatever the case may be. And with that, by the way, you know, one of the, the nuances or the challenges to be careful of is that most vendors and system integrators that I've seen in my career will suggest to their customers that you don't need to worry about your future state business processes. We have best practices, our software, as pre-configurations or industry best practices, whatever whatever buzzword they want to use for it. And the reality is, is that just doesn't exist. It's, it's very rare that you find that pre-configurations or industry solutions or uh, commercial off-the-shelf standard best practices, it's very rare that they actually apply to any given organization. 
Now, it may be true for some of the more standard, more vanilla business processes uh, like accounts payable, GL, uh, maybe procurement and purchasing, things of that nature. But once you start getting into manufacturing and um, your customer service, the way you take orders, the way you interact with your customers, the way you manage your supply chain, chances are pretty slim that you're going to have best practices. It's typically going to be uh, a number of decisions that still need to be made to be able to configure the software. It's not like you can just flip a switch and the software works. There's a million questions that need to be answered as part of that that design of the software. So if you don't have your processes defined, you spend a lot of time um, and a lot of money during the implementation doing something uh, that's, very, that's highly ineffective to do that late in the project. Um, and the other alternative is that when you don't have your business processes well defined, you're going to have a bunch of consultants and technology type people making those decisions for you because they'll just configure the software the way they think it should be configured, um, which then contributes back to misalignment and some of the other problems we've, we've talked about here. And then finally, the number five, uh, the fifth thing on the top five reasons why uh, companies face challenges in these transformations is the, the fact that they had trouble with their data migration. And data migration is oftentimes viewed as sort of a uh, uh, after afterthought. So it's uh, we, we see a lot of system integrators who either push that entire responsibility onto a client and the client doesn't know how to what to do to start cleaning up their data and how to map the data to the new system and how to migrate the data. But a lot of SOWs will will just push that responsibility onto the onto the customer. Um, the other challenge you have with with data is oftentimes system integrators. I don't want to say they don't care, but that's not really their job. To, to migrate data. Their job is to deliver a system or a series of systems that can manage that data. So if your data isn't ready or the data is corrupt or you don't have the right data sources, it's not really, you know, it's not really their problem necessarily. It's something that you've got to figure out. So the, the sooner you can start that data migration in your process, and we typically advise clients to, and we help our clients to do that during the implementation readiness before, even before your system integrator starts oftentimes we're already working on the data piece of it to make sure we have a clear data management uh, strategy and plan. So those are the five big challenges that organizations face with, with their transformations. And by the way, um, it, as we go on to the next slide here, if you have questions, uh, I know I'm, I feel like I'm talking very quickly today or very fast. So feel free to stop me and ask questions and I'm happy to, to stop along the way and answer those. Or if, if not, I can, uh, we'll leave time at the end as well. So another consideration and another risk to think about with digital transformation is this whole notion of operational disruption. So often organizations get so myopically focused on what is this going to cost me? This implementation in the acquisition of software is going to cost me X, you know, X million dollars, whatever the number is. Um, and they don't consider and don't think about what is the real, what is the real total cost of ownership? And what is the real cost to the organization? And what I mean by that is, first of all, more often than not, organizations have unrealistic expectations for their actual implementation budget. They don't budget enough time and money and the system integrator underbids the project and underestimates and then they change order them to death. And so it ends up driving up your implementation cost. But that's actually not the biggest risk you have. But that's where most CFOs and COOs and executive teams are focused is let's make sure we manage that implementation cost. And that's important. You do want to do that. But the even bigger risk is what happens after you implement. And it's rare that organizations even think about what what is the risk or what is the cost to us if things don't go well. So, for example, if we can't ship product for 30 days because the, the system failed to deliver and people aren't using the system the way it should be. And we just for whatever reason, there's breakdowns at go live and now we can't ship product. What does that cost us? And you do want to put a price tag around this stuff because what it is, is essentially risk. I mean, that's the risk of, of a, a botched project is that you can't, if you can't ship product for 30 days, as an example, what is that cost in terms of your lost revenue, your lost profit, your deferred revenue, your deferred profit, uh, the morale impact that that has on your employees. You have to quantify all those costs because what you see here, that the second, um, the second uh, blue box on the left side of the screen here, it shows you that the initial um, or, or the the impact of operational disruption can be anywhere from 50% to 300% of the total budget. So in other words, if your budget was $10 million to implement, and that's what you're going to spend on the implementation, 
the average organization could have anywhere from from uh, five million to thirty million of of operational disruption costs, and so those costs can actually dwarf the cost of the implementation. And by the way, I, I skipped an important point, which is the first blue box at the top, which is that over fifty percent of organizations typically experience some sort of operational or, or material operational disruption at the time of go live. And what I mean by material disruption is not just it was a little bit awkward, it was a little bit uncomfortable, we were a little bit less productive because every organization has that problem. This means that we had some major breakdown at the time of go live in terms of not being able to ship product, not being able to, to uh, process customer orders, not being able to close the books, something along those lines that in most cases would be deemed unacceptable. And so it's amazing that still over 50% of organizations spend all this time and money on their implementations and end up with these unacceptable results. So the key here is to do a lot of the things that I talked about on the previous slide and some of the you know, best practices that are being shared by all of the speakers throughout this event. Um, that's one thing, but also it's important to really understand the trade-offs you make in the implementation and how that affects the bigger cost or the biggest risk of additional cost. So for example, I'll give you a real simple example that ties back to, to Teresa's presentation yesterday. She talked a lot about change management. Um, and one of the questions we often get is how much of our budget should we spend on change management? Well, you know, you could in theory say spend a million dollars on change management. On paper, you could save a million dollars by cutting change management. That's one way to save a million dollars on in this example. And so oftentimes exec executives will look at that and say, well, let's save a million dollars then. Why spend the million dollars if we don't need to? Well, you could do that, but what does that mean to the adoption into the overall organizational change? And what does that mean to the go live and the disruption that's going to have? So in other words, it could be that you saved a million dollars over here in implementation, but now you've created multi-million dollar problems at the time of go live because you can't ship product. And so you can't look at it myopically, just one side of the equation. You have to look at what are we investing uh, in terms of time, cost and resources on the implementation and what is the impact on go live? And that's a that's a trade off or a full big picture view that that a lot of uh, organizations, if not most organizations and consultants, by the way, typically don't consider. And so that's something that needs to be considered as you, as you think through this is how can we ensure that we get through this project, not only in a way that's you know efficient and effective on time on budget, but also one that doesn't disrupt our business and one that allows us to ensure that we mitigate the risks um, along the way during that during that transformation. So some of the keys then to digital transformation success, then, you know, we've talked about where some of the challenges are, but now if we, we sort of um, back up a little bit and say, well, how do we avoid these problems? I mean, no one, I don't think anyone on this call or in this event will want their transformation to look like what, you know, I've just described here with the, uh, the challenges and some of the operational disruptions. So what do we do? How can we, you know, can, can we avoid those problems is a big question. And it, the answer is a resounding yes, you, they can be avoided and they are fairly predictable. You know, the, the things that organizations do to create a lot of the problems that I just described are, are pretty predictable. On the flip side of the equation, the things that make projects successful are fairly predictable. It's not, it's not a surprise. In other words, it's usually um, when you see a failed project or a successful project, it's usually, you know, if you look at what they did, and what the organizations focused on and how they prioritized and the leadership behind it, um, the decisions behind it, how they manage their system integrator, all that stuff. It's pretty, it's a pretty common pattern in both buckets, the failures and the successes, you know, each one has different patterns, but they're very consistent within that bucket. So one of the, one of the first things to remember is that the failure can be avoided. So it, it's not just uh, that these failures happen. It's not just bad luck. Um, a lot of times the organizations themselves feel as though they're sort of deer in the headlights. You know, they don't know what just happened to them. They don't know what's happening to them as it's happening. Uh, but it's not luck. There's something behind it that's very consistent and predictable and in, in why those failures are, why those projects are failing. And so there are technology agnostic best practices that help avoid these sorts of failures. Um, one of the biggest things that, that I constantly repeat, if you watch my videos, read my blogs or podcasts or anything like that, I constantly repeat that, you know, bias in the industry is one of the biggest problems with transformations. And the bias comes from vendors, it comes from consultants that are focused on one technology, 
It comes from the blind spots in the industry. It comes from the, the monetary and economic incentives to sell more software. There's a ton of bias in this industry, which is why I started third stage, because I, I didn't like that there was so much bias. And I was part of that bias when I you know, started my career. So I wanted to create a company that was sort of the opposite of that, that, that was unbiased, that didn't represent vendor best interest, but represented client best interest. And the reason that's so important is you do need to focus more on yourself and your business, your strategy and goals and objectives, and less on the software vendors and what they think you should do. Because again, their, their job is to sell you software and to be agnostic and independent is one of the best ways you can you can mitigate some of those some of those risks. And then the last thing on the slide I'll mention uh, is is a final point is that you don't want to settle for mediocre results. I mean, a lot of organizations are just glad to be in business after they get through a transformation. They're they're just glad they didn't have a complete unmitigated disaster. Um, that's a pretty low bar to set, and you should really be aiming to not just not fail, but why, why are you going through this project in the first place? You're not doing it to not fail. You're, you should be doing it to transform your business, improve your business, make it more ready for the 2020s and the 2030s, um, you know, make your employees more happy to be there, provide better service to your customers, all that stuff. So that should be where your mind should be, not on let's not screw this up. Because if your focus is on not screwing it up, you're probably going to fall a bit short of that goal. Whatever goal you set, you'll probably fall a bit short because these projects are hard. So you don't want to set the bar that low. Um, and if you're focused on not failing, it creates this defensive, um, this defensive mindset and this defensive decision making process that usually, ironically, leads to more likelihood of failure. So, for example, if I'm so focused on not failing or not blowing my budget, I'm probably going to make some bad short sighted decisions like let's cut change management because that's going to save us a bunch of money. Um, that would be an example of how I might make a decision if I'm just trying not to fail. Although the irony of that is if you really don't want to fail, you should probably invest more in change management. So that sort of decision making is, is very difficult for organizations. But the key here is that uh, the failure can uh, certainly be avoided. So the next takeaway here in terms of what some of these best practices are for a successful transformation is to start with a clear digital strategy. Make sure you have a clear vision and that you've articulated and translated the vision into what the transformation means and what the project governance behind that transformation is so that you have that clear vision of where you're headed and, and what you want to be when you grow up. One of the biggest challenges we see with organizations is um, it's almost like a uh, if you think if you think of a um, not a bell curve, but think of a graph that maps out the, the morale and excitement and the momentum you have on a project like this. Usually it's pretty, you know, it's pretty moderate. Let's just say when you first start the initial exploration of new technologies, but as you get momentum in that project and the, you know, the executive team and the board approves the budget to go evaluate potential systems and they create that internal alignment and focus on we're going to move forward with a new system replacement or digital transformation. What ends up happening is you create excitement and momentum and people get really excited and then they start to see the technologies and the possibilities that could be within their organization. And they get really excited and momentum's high, morale's high, right as you're selecting new software and you're getting ready to start the implementation. Unfortunately, that momentum peaks right there, right at the point where you decide on new technology and you get approval to move forward, you mobilize a team, everyone's excited. The minute you start facing headwinds and start stepping in landmines, the morale starts to drop, the excitement and the momentum drops from its, from its peak. And the reason I bring up this dynamic is it's at that point, at that peak point is where a lot of organizations make bad decisions because they're so blinded by the optimism and the excitement that they don't think about, you know, hey, maybe we should slow things down a bit and make sure we have a clear strategy and plan. And mo we've mobilized our resources. We've defined our business processes and we started to take a look at our data. We've we've uh, we have a we have a clear data migration strategy. We have an organizational assessment and organizational change strategy to address the unique organizational challenges that we're going to face during this transformation. They don't take the time to do all that stuff because they want to jump in and start implementing stuff because they're so excited. And, and then the, the vendors and the system integrators add fuel to that situation by saying, yeah, close the deal today and I'll give you a special deal that is a once in a lifetime deal. And you therefore sign the contracts and all of a sudden you've got a million people, not a million, but you've got an army of consultants and a bunch of software that you're paying for starting on day one. And then it creates this this whole domino effect now, a ripple effect of rushing um, towards an unclear goal and strategy. 
So you really want to make sure you've got that long-term strategy, the alignment, and that any decision you make along the way should be aligned with those longer term goals and objectives and the, the blueprint and the parameters that you've defined before you've ever started deploying technology. The other um, takeaway too, the other sort of best practice uh, as, as I call them here is to, to let business drive the technology. Don't let the technology drive the business. Now, technology is certainly going to provide you tools and capabilities that you don't have today, for sure. So, of course, the technology is going to bring you things that you, you can't do today or it's very difficult to do today. But at the end of the day, your business and your business needs should drive the technology. It should be all about your strategy, your goals, objectives, what you're trying to do operationally, strategically, what sort of customer experience you're trying to enable, what kind of employee experience you're trying to enable, what kind of business value and ROI you're trying to create as an organization that should all drive the technology deployment. Unfortunately, most organizations flip that and they focus so much on the technology. And then the vendors, of course, are focused on the technology because that's what they do. And so you've got all these people focused on technology, but not the business. And so you, you really have to flip the script on that and focus more on the business. Let the, let the dog wag the tail instead of the tail wagging the dog. And it's important to remember that it's not an IT project, even if your CIO is the executive sponsor, or even if your IT team is heavily involved, which they should be in the project, um, it's not them that's leading. It shouldn't be them that's leading. It should be a business-driven initiative that focuses on business operation, strategy, business value, and the people, et cetera. Um, also, same with business process improvements. I mentioned before that the whole concept of software best practices and pre-configurations is a myth. It doesn't, they don't exist in terms of effective use. Um, they do exist and it's a great selling point. It's a great marketing message for vendors and you can occasionally use them to your benefit, but more often than not, it's, it's a misleading uh, myth that it just doesn't add material value to a project. So you want to make sure that you do have, you know, business process improvements defined up front that then you're going to use to, uh, technology to help enable. Um, it's, it's backwards to, it may seem counterintuitive to some, but it is backwards to assume that we're just going to deploy technology and the technology will, will give us the answer for what our process improvements are going to be. If you take that mindset, then what's going to happen is, again, the path of least resistance, the organization is going to deploy technology the way they've always used technology because that's what they know and that's what they want. That's why you need a clear vision, a clear roadmap, a clear blueprint for what you want in terms of process improvements and the operational model going forward. And then finally, your, your uh, transformation should be closely aligned with measurable strategic goals. And sounds simple enough, but you, it's, a, it's a common trap that organizations fall into that they get so enamored by technology, but they can't necessarily articulate how that technology is going to drive measurable strategic goals and objectives. And if you can't connect the dots, then that's probably a good indicator that maybe you should think about not buying that technology or not deploying that technology. And so you want to make sure that you don't get too caught up again in all the buzzwords and hype around AI and predictive analytics and machine learning. That stuff's great, but it may or may not add value to your business. And so that's really the key is to understand where is this technology going to add value to our business? And if it doesn't, Maybe we don't deploy that technology, or maybe we look at a third party bolt on for that part of the business, or maybe we just focus on improving the processes and standardizing some ways we do things and leveraging the technology we already have. That That's okay too. So it's a, it's a matter of really having a clear vision of how the business will drive the technology and not the other way around. And another root cause of a, of a lot of failure points and a lot of mistakes that happen in a project uh, is this concept of unrealistic expectations. So Oftentimes when that, that peak momentum point happens, which I talked about earlier, that peak momentum happens, we have pretty unrealistic expectations at that point. As humans, when we're excited, momentum's high, we see a vision for the future, um, it doesn't seem that difficult. You know, it feels like it, it, we're all ready, right? We're ready to move forward. We found our software. We're about to sign a contract um, that the vendor's promising us the world. They've told us we can implement this project, say, in 18 months. Um, yeah, let's go, let's go forward. And so you end up with this mindset that everything's great, everything's perfect. And you get into the project and realize it's not, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of headwinds. There's a lot of risk, a lot of things that you don't know when the peak, uh, excitement is there. So you want to be sure that you have a, a dose of healthy skepticism to make sure you have realistic expectations because you, you want to understand what the risks are. 
um, even at that time of peak excitement in a project, you still need to be thinking about, well, where are the risks? Okay. Because this is, this is exciting, right? But there are risks out there on the battlefield that we're about to enter. Let's go find where those landmines or risks are rather than assume they're not there because we can't see them. They're there. We just need to find them so we don't step on them. So, and we can do that, by the way, in a way that's not demoralizing. Um, in fact, it's it should be more empowering and more exciting to know that, hey, I see what's out there and I know what I'm about to do, rather than this sort of a, a blind fog that, that we might be walking into. So making sure we've got those realistic expectations is critical. Um, that misalignment oftentimes with the misalignment around expectations often leads to rash and bad decisions. Um, again, if we if we don't um, if we have unrealistic expectations, what ends up happening is because we think this implementation is going to take 18 months, which let's just say for hypothetical purposes, it was never going to be 18 months. It's more like 36 months. But I'm being told it's 18 months. I'm creating a, all these parameters, these false parameters around an 18 month project. And I'm going to get at some point into that project and realize, wow, there's no way we're going to do this in 18 months. So therefore, I need to cut scope. I need to cut change management from the, the schedule. I can't worry about data migration now. I'm just going to have to you know, start over with new data, whatever. I'm just giving some examples here. But those sorts of decisions end up being bad decisions that you end up having to make because you had unrealistic expectations. So that's why it's so important to make sure you have those expectations aligned and clear and realistic up front. And you also want to make sure that you understand the risk with time, cost, and resources. And as I mentioned, you want to make sure you have some professional skepticism uh, with your vendor. The point of this, um, this thought here is that your implementation process and the time and resources and money you invest in your implementation should far exceed the time and money you invest in the software evaluation and selection. A lot of times organizations get caught up in sort of an analysis paralysis cycle. They, they, uh, on one hand, you want to give them kudos because they're being very thorough in their evaluation and they're making sure that they find the right software, which is great. But on the other hand, no technology is perfect. And the more the more you analyze any product that's out there, any system or any technology that you might want to deploy, you're going to find problems with it, things that don't match exactly what you need. And that's OK. You, you want to know what those are, but you also don't want to get so hung up that you can't make a decision because you can't find that that unicorn or that rainbow of perfect software that doesn't exist. So it's one way to look at this is you don't want to rush the selection process. You want to be thorough. You want to make sure you find the right technology. But at some point, you get a point of diminishing returns. You're, you're overthinking it. You're spending too much time and money on the selection. And the way you have to look at this is resources are limited. Every time or every hour of time and every dollar of budget you spend on the selection process is one less hour and one less dollar you can spend on the implementation. So the faster you can get to a good decision means that you can spend more time and money on the implementation, which is where the real challenge and where the real um, potential success comes from. So you want to make sure you've got that that selection uh, done in an objective, effective, fast way. And that's just as an example of a way we help our clients do that is we have a, a database that has 30,000 business requirements against close to a thousand different systems. Um, in the marketplace. And so we can go and pull up any of those requirements to see which systems best handle those requirements. And it's a good objective way to provide objective data that sort of counterbalances the bias data you're going to get from your vendors and the demos and the RFP process. But it also uh, speeds things up too. You know, it's going to make us help us get to that short list and help us get to a decision faster because we have that tool set supporting us. So that's just one example of how you can be effective, speed things up and focus more on the implementation. And you, you really want to make sure of, of consulting firms or project teams that drag out the selection process, either because they don't know what they're doing and they don't know enough about the different systems in the market. Um, or it could be that that's, you know, if it's a, a software selection firm, it maybe that's how they make their money. So they want to spend more time and money on it. So um, you, you just be leery of all that. You want to make sure that you've got a, a realistic and aggressive but effective uh, selection process so that you can spend more time on the implementation. And then a, a, a sixth thing here is to know that there are no silver bullets. So you have to be aware of the industry hype and all the best practices and industry pre-configurations and the the, uh, the hype around the cloud and how easy it is to deploy how cloud technologies. 
just be aware that there's a lot of silver bullets out there. There's always going to be, there always has been. Um, that's how vendors sell, right? They, they create hype and they, they perpetuate that hype by not only selling their software, but also hiring industry analysts to put out reports that are telling you the same thing, which is technology is great. And these are the silver bullets. You know, some of the common things, you, you know, some of the most common areas of hype right now in, in the industry are certainly cloud is one. And it's not to say that people shouldn't be moving to the cloud, but it's it's to say that if you're moving to the cloud, just know that there it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't make your implementation easier. It's just not going to make it easier. You still have to change your processes. You still have to change your people. You still struggle with all the failure points or the risk points that I've already talked about. None of that stuff goes away as a result of cloud. So you just have to be aware the cloud is is a silver bullet. Another example is agile. You know, a lot of times now, um, I think what the software vendors and system integrators are doing is they're sort of piggybacking on this um, lean startup trend, I guess you call it, and in agile movements within the software development space, they're kind of piggybacking on those trends to to address a perceived problem in the industry, which is implementations take too long and take too much money. So what they're doing is they're saying, well, let's call it an agile approach. Then we'll be agile in our in our implementations. Well. That's great. It sounds good, but it, just because you're going faster in the wrong direction doesn't mean that's the right answer. So you just want to be be uh, aware of, and again, back to that skepticism. Make sure you understand what some of those challenges are. Um, and I, I mentioned, uh, you know, anything that has to do with cookie cutter or fix all strategies, you want to be be leery of whenever a vendor's telling you that this solves all your problems because it, it's not going to solve them all. And the key takeaway here is that last bullet, which is that transformations are hard. So whether you're using an agile approach or deploying cloud technologies or uh, pre-configured industry solutions. Okay, maybe there's some benefit to that stuff, but at the end of the day, this is hard work. You've got to roll up your sleeves, change your processes, change your people, figure out how your systems and data are going to tie together. There's a lot of risk associated with a project like this. So none of that stuff goes away. You still have to do all that. So that's the risk of silver bullets is it creates this false expectation that things are going to be easier than they really are. And then the seventh thing is to control the tempo of the project. And I mentioned this earlier, that it's your project. You don't want to be rushed prematurely into implementation just because you're getting a, a once in a lifetime deal on software licenses or software subscriptions, um, which by the way, uh, those once in a lifetime deals typically are honored at any point you're ready to buy software. So don't fall for that. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why organizations rush and it's, it's, it's important to remember that it's it's always better, it's cheaper and faster to implement right the first time. It's a lot more expensive when you have to redo it or have two or three tries at this. You might as well spend less time and money on the overall project by doing it right the first time. And again, you can look at a budget on paper and see that it shows a number, but oftentimes that number is not realistic. It's, it's actually going to balloon to say double that. So then that begs the question of, okay, instead of doubling an unrealistic number, what if we take that unrealistic number, make it realistic? Maybe we add 20% or whatever the number is to the time and budget, but that ensures that we have more likelihood of success. So you want to get it right the first time. And you also want to, um, you know, address conflicting priorities and understand that if you are going through a massive amount of change as an organization, and a software vendor is coming in telling you they can implement in six months or 12 months or 18 months or some unrealistic number, you have to understand that, well, maybe we push back and say, well, let's not make it a 12 month project. Let's make it a 24 month project to account for the fact that we have competing priorities. We're going through a lot of changes in organization and maybe we're risk adverse. We just move slowly as an organization that it's not the time, you know, it's not the time to decide you're going to be a fast moving, aggressive organization if you're not doing a big implementation or transformation is not the time to make that decision and then assume that you're just going to be more aggressive or change your culture overnight because you're not going to. And you're also not going to change those competing priorities unless you have clear commitment from your leadership team to stop other initiatives that are conflicting with that. So you just want to be realistic about the landscape, the culture, who you are, and, and let that drive the tempo of your project, not the, not the uh, software vendors or, or system integrators. So all this, this is all transformation. It all takes time. And then finally, last but not least, in fact, I'd say most importantly, change management. The, the organizations that fail, and, and when I say fail, I'm, I'm referring to projects that clients have helped us or, or hired us to come recover because they failed with themselves or with another consulting firm, or in cases where an attorney hires us 
like Marcus Harris, who you'll hear from later today. An attorney like Marcus hires us to be an expert witness in a failed lawsuit or a failed project that has led to lawsuit. What we find in all those cases, every single instance, is that change management wasn't addressed properly. There was a under focus, lack of focus on change management, but yet this people component is the most important. So it is very safe to say, and I'm very skeptical of any sort of universal um, one size fits all sorts of solutions or answers with the exception of the fact of that se second bullet, which is that your project will fail without change management. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a high growth startup type of company or if you're a mature multi-billion dollar global organization, no matter who you are, you're, the project is going to fail if you don't address change management well. Every organization is full of people that are that are imperfect. Every organization has a culture that is going to be disrupted by this project. Every organization has its own business processes and systems that are going to be disrupted by this project. All that means that you need change management. If without it, you, you're going to fail. And that typically goes well beyond training and communications. Um, that includes things that uh, I've included examples of here, organizational design, defining what job roles and responsibilities are going to look like going forward, uh, business readiness, the change impact, understanding how different departments and individuals are affected by the changes and then ultimately helping them through those changes. Uh, benefits realization, the communications, the uh, executive alignment. Those are all examples, just a few examples of areas where change management uh, can help enable uh, some of these, these process improvements or, or help enable a more effective transformation. And, and one of the, um, another thing, if you're interested in more about change management, in addition to listening to Teresa's, Teresa Richardson's presentation from yesterday about change management, I also encourage you to download our change management guide. Um, which you can find on our website. If you just go to um, thirdstage-consulting.com, go to the resource center, you'll find a guide to change management that you can download that has a bunch of, it elaborates a lot more on a, a lot of the stuff on this slide here. So those are a few of the things that, uh, you know, eight things that are critical to any uh, transformation. And it's really the ways to uh, avoid failure and uh, address some of the, the risks that we've talked about. Um, as always, the previous slide shows our, our different offices and contact information. If you'd like to reach out to any of our team members um, at any of the four uh, regional offices internationally that, that we have, that's that's the contact information. You can always email us at info at thirdstage-consulting.com. And then on this last slide, I'll, I'll include all my social media stuff. So if you're not following me on social media, be sure to do that. I put out stuff uh, borderline obsessively uh, on a, or maybe full on obsessively, depending on how you look at it. Um, I put stuff out daily on the different uh, social media channels, so be sure to check that out. So uh, with that, I'll stop there and see what, what questions you all have.